This is Channel 7 Eyewitness News with Bill Butel and Susan Rosegen, Scott Clark with Sports, Sam Champion with the exclusive AccuWeather forecast and the Eyewitness News team. Now, Eyewitness News. The jailhouse gates rumble down as a prison van carries John Gotti to a future behind bars. Prosecutors say, Don Voyage, goodbye to John Gotti, who's headed now for the prison yard. The Teflon is gone, the Don is covered with Velcro, and every charge in the indictment stuck. Good evening, I'm Bill Butel, and John Gotti knows it all too well tonight. After a six-year crusade to bring him down, the government's case stuck to him like glue. Tonight, John Gotti stands convicted, found guilty on every count against him. And the top dog in the country's most powerful crime family can only look at the moon through jailhouse bars. He was guilty of the murder of Paul Castellano, of the murder of Robert DiBernardo, guilty, of the murder of Louis Melito, guilty, and of the murder of Louis de Bono, guilty. It's a litany that could mean life in prison for John Gotti. And Jim Dolan has been in Brooklyn federal court ever since the trial began seven and a half weeks ago. Jim? Bill, 12 courageous New Yorkers today put away their fears and waded through the confusion and decided in the end that John Gotti was telling the truth. On the secretly recorded audio tapes played at the trial, Gotti himself boasted that he was the boss of the Gambino crime family. Gotti himself bragged that he ordered several murders. The jury decided to take him at his word. The prosecution team that put John Gotti behind bars for the rest of his life had plenty to celebrate in a high-stakes gamble that pitted the integrity of the nation's judicial system against organized crime, the Justice Department came up aces. If John Gotti was acquitted, I thought it would give a shot in the arm to organized crime throughout the United States, and John Gotti would achieve a status that not even Al Capone or others in the past have achieved. I was convinced if John Gotti was convicted, it would be the death knell for organized crime. And U.S. Attorney Andrew Maloney, who watched Gotti walk out of a federal courtroom five years ago, savored the victory. I was determined to bring John Gotti to justice, yes, five years ago when he walked out of this courthouse. Uh, fortunately, I'm still around to see it happen. Inside the packed, hushed courtroom, John Gotti sat with a wise guy grin as the jury returned with its verdict. He stared at the jury as he had stared at the witnesses who testified against him, daring them to continue. But as the enormity of his defeat became apparent as guilty verdict after guilty verdict was read by the jury forewoman, the facade never cracked. He mumbled some, told someone else to shut up, but he smiled throughout. And after the jury was polled, he was swept away by federal marshals. We were hurt and stunned by the verdict, and our support came from John Gotti and Frank Locasio. It all started right here, a blood-soaked street on the east side where former Gambino godfather Paul Castellano was gunned down on Gotti's order in a brazen storm of gunfire in December of 1985. Gotti would climb over the body of Paul Castellano to ascend the throne of the nation's most powerful crime family. Murder would become his favorite tool, the way he attained power and the way he maintained control. And for a while, he managed to avoid the law. But in the end, he made two crucial mistakes. These guys going to arrest I got him. One of his mistakes was naming this man as his underboss. Sammy the Bull Gravano was Gotti's most trusted friend, a man who had helped kill Castellano and had killed several others on Gotti's orders. But in a move that shook the underworld and shocked the FBI, Gravano turned state's evidence and in exchange for a lighter sentence for himself, testified against his former boss. Gravano, the highest ranking mobster to ever sing for the government, provided the trial with its highest drama. For nine days he sat on the witness stand, the boss and the rat, 20 feet apart, staring threateningly at one another across the courtroom. Two men accustomed to settling their differences with gunfire, forced to keep their trigger fingers in their pockets. Gravano admitted to 19 murders and a lifetime of crime, but despite all that baggage, his testimony about John Gotti sounded suspiciously like the truth. If one can infer anything, and you can speculate as easy as I, it's obviously they believed everything Sam Gravano had to say. Gotti's other mistake was not keeping his mouth shut. Yes, the jury believed Sam Gravano, but hearing Gotti on the secretly recorded audio tapes order murders and brag about murders he'd ordered in the past and complain that murders he'd ordered had not yet been committed was all more than this courageous jury could ignore. And they decided to end the murderous reign of the man who said he wanted everything run a Cosa Nostra way. The defendants and their attorneys kept saying they have total faith in the jury system. 
Well, the jury has spoken, and we're very gratified. Gotti co-defendant Frank Lacasio was also convicted of everything he was charged with except one gambling count. Sentencing will be held for both men June 23rd, but it won't be very exciting. Federal guidelines virtually forced the judge to put John Gotti away, as his lawyer said during the trial, until he's carried out of jail in a box. Bill? And um, you won't have to go down to that courtroom for a no, while. Boy. That's right. <laughs> it's Thanks, nice Jim, to have you much. back from the underworld. Thanks, Thank Jim. you. One of Gotti's old stomping grounds was the Ravenite Social Club in Little Italy, where the feds secretly taped conversations. So today, some jokester put a sign on the Ravenite door. It read, for rent, call 1-800-FED-CORE, meaning federal corrections. And it made one of the club patrons so angry, he tore it down. On Mulberry Street, loyalty to the Don is strong. They wanted him at any cost, and they got him at any cost. He was the best guy around. What about the people he murdered? What so murder? So Gotti may be convicted, but to some people he is still beloved. To some people he is still the Teflon Don. John Gotti's neighborhood is a special place. He's the most well-known man in the neighborhood and a sort of guardian of the place. The Don's home turf is Howard Beach, Queens, an ordinary neighborhood that is pretty extraordinary because that's where John Gotti lives. Tappy Phillips is live there in Howard Beach. Tappy? And Bill, John Gotti Jr. walked into this house just a few minutes ago, accompanied by a bodyguard, but he and the rest of the family are keeping to themselves tonight. Other family members have come in and out of John Gotti's house here in Howard Beach tonight, but they're being very tight-lipped about today's verdict. John Gotti's daughter, Vicki, wearing a mink coat, ran from the house to a waiting car tonight. She had nothing to say about her father's conviction on charges of murder and racketeering. But earlier, a family friend expressed their sentiment. Stink. There was an old yellow ribbon on a tree in front of the Gotti house tonight for the celebration that never was. Some neighbors didn't want to talk, but others were willing to defend their friend, the Don. They got railroad. Why do you say that? I'm living in this neighborhood 22 years. I don't think he got his rights. I don't think so. No, I'm not surprised. They did what they had to do, and... Uh, feel bad for the guy. All I know is he's a good guy. Shouldn't have happened. So it is quiet here tonight. No celebration, no fireworks as there had been following previous not guilty verdicts. This verdict has at least temporarily silenced the Gotties and the mob. We're live in Howard Beach, Queens, Tappy Phillips, Channel 7 Eyewitness News. Can you imagine being on that gaudy jury? You're supposed to decide the fate of a man whose very name terrifies anyone who's afraid of the mob. Well, tonight we have an exclusive interview with a man who had to judge Gotti in a previous case and is not afraid to talk about it. They look through your mail, your, they monitor your phone calls, when you're allowed phone calls. Uh, Life in the eye of a storm. Life as a Gotti juror. Richard Zelensky was one of 12 jurors to find John Gotti innocent of conspiracy and assault in the February 1990 trial, an acquittal that secured until today Gotti's reputation as the Teflon Don. But he also has a reputation as the nation's most notorious mobster. It might have given others cause for concern, but it never frightened this quiet Manhattan anymore. resident. He, he's meticulous, he's, he's, he's gorgeously groomed, he's well-dressed, uh, and this is what you see. You're hearing other things that say, this, this, he does this, he does that, but you're looking at the man, he's not threatening to you. Selensky says from what he's seen, there were some big differences between the government's case now and then. On the tapes of our trial, he's never talking about criminal activities, never. Also, the quality was extremely poor. You really had to listen, and without transcripts, you would be lost. But as the judge said, it's what you hear, it's not what you read. And Selensky says that the current Gotti jury shouldn't be afraid of retribution from the mob because he thinks the mob realizes that retribution is not good for business. Tonight, with all but one alleged head of a crime family behind bars, organized crime would seem to be in chaos. In addition to John Gotti, who was convicted today, Victor Arena, said to be the acting boss of the Colombo family, was arrested yesterday. He now faces murder charges. Carmine Persico, said to be the head of the Colombo family, has been in jail since last summer for a failed assassination attempt on Arena. And Vittorio Amuso of the Lucchese family is in jail awaiting trial on nine murder charges. Still on the street is Vincent Giganti of the Genovese family, but he's awaiting trial on charges of racketeering. With John Gotti and the other leaders in prison, what happens to the mob? They can't run their families from prison cells forever. And very often there's a mob war as men fight to become the new Don, the new boss of bosses. Is a, is a mob war in the cards now? Tim Minton reports. With its head decapitated in court, 
the body and soul of the Gambino family's up for grabs. And like Gotti, the next boss could be elected with bullets. When the organization is breaking down as it is right now, um, there will be less peaceable resolution uh, of problems and more and more random violence. That's what happened last year in a struggle for the Colombo family. Henry Hank the Bank Smora was an early victim after reportedly botching a hit on boss Victor Arena. Several more bloody bodies also hit the street in retaliation before the government finally got Arena indicted just yesterday. It's hard to say at this point who's going to become the most powerful figure in, in, uh, in the five families in New York and in throughout the country. I think at this point, most people are running for cover. According to law enforcement sources, among those in the running for the top crime job are Joe Butch Correa, a reputed Gambino boss who's facing his own racketeering indictment. Nicky Carrazzo is another possibility. He beat the rap with the then Teflon Don five years ago. And there's reputed Gambino capo John Gotti Jr. If he lives long enough. Whatever power he had was derivative from his father. Mm -hmm. With his father uh, having lost it, um, he, he, has, uh, he has problems. Whoever the next Don is, he may have to scale back the family business. For one thing, there's increased risk of business reversals due to rats like Sammy Gravano. And there's law enforcement on a roll looking for a new target. Tim Minton, Channel 7, Eyewitness News. And some footnotes on our Gotti coverage tonight. The boss will find out just how bad life will be for him when he is sentenced June 23rd. And the indications tonight are that Gotti will be bunking with the worst of the worst at the Marion Federal Penitentiary in Illinois. And effective tonight, the Dapper Don is no more. He has had to trade in his designer suits for orange cotton prison overalls.